Madeline Lengel wrote, the writing of a book may be a solitary business. It is done alone. The writer sits down with paper and pen or typewriter and withdrawn from the world tries to set down the story that is crying to be written. We write alone, but we do not write in isolation. No matter how fantastic a storyline may be, it still comes out of our response to what is happening to us and to the world in which we live. I totally agree. Welcome to the Stark Reflections on Writing and Publishing podcast. There has never been a better time for writers. More information, options, and opportunities are available to you. But navigating these requires insight. Join Mark Leslie Lefebvre as he draws upon more than a quarter century of experience as a writer, a bookseller, and a trusted book industry consultant to explore and reflect on the writing and publishing landscape to help you make informed choices on your writer journey. Hello, Reflectives, and welcome to episode 263 of the Stark Reflections podcast. This is your host, Mark Leslie Lefebvre. Today's episode is a special episode. It's part one of two, and this is related to the keynotes that I uh, had the luxury, the privilege of emceeing at When Words Collide, which was a virtual conference, normally takes place in Calgary, Alberta. And what you're going to hear in this episode is you're going to hear two of the four keynotes. You're going to hear the keynote talks from Terry Brooks, the keynote talk from Susanna Kearsley. And that's coming up later in this episode. But first, let's hear a word from this episode's sponsor. This episode is sponsored by Findaway Voices. Now, Findaway Voices is a platform for audiobook distribution and creation. And you can use it however you see fit. You can use Findaway Voices to find a professional narrator, and there's two different ways. There's more of a manual process where you put in a request and you work with the project manager at Findaway Voices who finds the five to ten narrators that they think will suit your purposes, or you can go to the marketplace and you can search for your own. You can also, if you already have the audiobook produced and ready to go, you can use Findaway Voices for distribution. And when you distribute, you distribute to more than 43 retail and library platforms. And one of the cool things, and I just did this this morning that I'm recording this, and I'm recording this on Wednesday, August 17th, 2022, I just submitted a few different of my, uh, audiobook titles through the promotions tool in Findaway Voices, and I sent promotional pricing to Apple Books, Barnes & Noble Audiobooks, and Chirp. Those are three of the promotional opportunities that you can kind of DIY when you're using Findaway Voices. And what I love about Findaway Voices is there's so much DIY available, including changing your own prices, setting your own prices, and of course, submitting to different promotions. And of course, speaking of promotions, the only way you can get your audiobooks into Chirp is through Findaway Voices, and Chirp is owned by BookBub. And of course, we all know the benefits of having a BookBub feature deal. And of course, you can get Chirp deals from BookBub through Findaway Voices, which I've used to great success a couple times earlier this year. And of course, I'm going to be submitting one probably in the near future with the release of the very next audiobook in my Canadian Werewolf series. But those are just some of the things you can do with Findaway Voices. If you want to check out how you can leverage Findaway Voices as an author, you can check them out over at starkreflections.ca slash findaway. Now, as previously mentioned, this is going to be a special, um, it's going to be part of a two-part episode. I just wanted to keep them roughly 45-ish minutes long. And so uh, episode 263 will be the When Words Collide keynotes, the, the first two which will be with Terry Brooks and Susanna Kearsley coming up later in this episode. And then there will be uh, a follow-on episode, episode 264, almost immediately. So it'll be a between episode between next Friday's episode. And that will be with Hank Philippi Ryan and Edward Willett. And I just wanted to share these keynotes with you because I found them so inspiring. Now, I was lucky enough to do the live streaming for the, um, the guests of honor for When Words Collide did the live streaming of the the readings, uh, and then the next night on the Friday of last week, the keynotes. And and as I was listening to them, I was just thinking, wow, this 
this is inspiring. This is something that I think my listeners would really appreciate. Now, I will include a link to the full video. It was basically an hour and a half full video where they did the keynotes. The uh, chair of When Words Collide, Randy, welcomed everyone to the conference because that's usually the kickoff for the conference, especially when it's in person. And then after they all finished their keynotes, uh, I sort of led a Q&A with the live virtual audience who had people asking questions from Facebook and YouTube, as well as some of the questions I wanted to ask. So the the format for this episode and the one following are going to basically be, uh, you're going to hear the keynotes and then uh, the first two keynotes at least, and this episode. And then I'm just going to do a really short reflection on, on you know, what one of the things from each of them that I wanted to pull out and share that with you. And like I said, that's coming up later in the episode. And now it's time to look at some comments from recent episodes. So over on starkreflections.ca, for episode 262, last week's episode, Rambling Hometown Reflections, I got a comment from Maddie Dalrymple that said, What a lovely episode. Thank you for sharing, Mark. Thank you, Maddie, for the comment. Over on Twitter... Uh, Edwin Downward said for that same episode, the latest Stark Reflection by Mark Leslie has me thinking about how my parents started asking us kids which of the many things they'd collected over the years we'd each like to have and then started giving them to us rather than waiting until they passed on. And, and thank you for that, Edwin. That Yeah, it's, it's kind of interesting because I was talking a lot about the possessions and the things that we're doing with the possessions uh, after somebody's gone, how to honor their memory, etc. So I'm um, glad that made you reflect. Thanks for sharing that reflection. Also on the Twitter sphere, Poppy Bullock at Book in Hand Bet One over on Twitter. It wasn't this wasn't in relation to any specific episode, but Poppy had said on Twitter, "Writers, what's your favorite podcast? I have a couple, but I'm always on the hunt for more. I've just found Stark Reflections with Mark Leslie." He was talking about the importance of a writing community, and it made me think of y'all. And uh, interesting that that came up, because you're probably going to hear a little bit more about community later on <laughs> in this episode. So thanks for Poppy. Glad you discovered the podcast. And uh, over in the comments, if you guys want to leave, what are some of the other podcasts you enjoy for writers? Feel free to leave those comments over in the comments over at starkreflections.ca or, or at me, at Mark Leslie. And of course, this other fun comment came in that is not related to this particular podcast, but about my recent guest appearance on episode 57 of the Fantastic Comic Fan podcast, where I was talking to the host about my love of comic books and how a lot of that inspired my main character, Michael Andrews, and the situations in my Canadian Werewolf series. This one came from DJ Jacobson. Uh, over on Twitter, and he said, come for Mark Leslie in a Spider-Man outfit, but stay for Mark Leslie in a Spider-Man outfit. And that's because with the promotional image that I shared for the podcast, I had a picture of the four of the books from my uh, Canadian Werewolf series, as well as um, a picture I've, I've used for profile picture for my author, where I'm standing in a Spider-Man suit with the mask off and holding the mask in my hand in a sort of Hamlet-like, um, you know, um, alas, poor... Yorick, I knew him, Horatio, that kind of uh, pose. Anyways, I thought that was kind of fun, so appreciate that. Uh, you, again, you can leave comments for me over on Twitter, at Mark Leslie, and you can also leave comments for any of the episodes over at startreflections.ca. And I'd like to welcome a new patron to the podcast this week. Welcome to the new patron, Kay Booth. Kay, thanks so much for joining the patrons who support this podcast over at patreon.com slash stark reflections Kay, let me know if you're having any issues accessing the additional content because for my patrons i do offer additional content over via patreon.com slash stark reflections so welcome k and thank you so much to all of those who support the podcast over at patreon.com slash stark reflections how many times can Mark say the same URL in the space of one and a half minutes? Well, stay tuned and you'll find out, dear listener. And that's it for the introductory matter for this episode. Why don't we get into the main content keynotes from When Words Collide 2022.
Terry Brooks was born in Illinois in 1944. He spent a great deal of his childhood and early adulthood dreaming up stories in and around Sinisippi Park, the very same setting for Running with the Demon. He received his undergraduate degree from Hamilton College, where he majored in English literature, and went on to earn his graduate degree from the School of Law at Washington and Lee University. A writer since high school and heavily influenced by William Faulkner, it took him seven years to finish writing The Sword of Shannara, which published in 1977. It became the first work of fiction to ever appear on the New York Times trade paperback bestseller list, where it remained for over five months. He published The Elf Stones of Shannara in 1982 and The Wish Song of Shannara in 1985, both bestsellers. Since that time, he has written numerous novels in the Shannara, Landover, and Word Void series, including being hand-selected by George Lucas to write the novelization of Star Wars The Phantom Menace, which hit number one on the New York Times bestseller list. The Shannara Chronicles, a first-season, ten-episode TV show, premiered January 5, 2016, on MTV. It adapts the Elf Stones of Shannara and features the creative talents of John Favreau, Al Go, Miles Miller, Jonathan Liebsman, and Terry Brooks as an executive producer. Terry Brooks lives with his wife Judine in the Pacific Northwest and on the road meeting his fans. What I'm doing today, you'll be happy to know, is I'm going to talk about something that I never talk about. In fact, I have made it a point never to talk about it until now because I despise this particular subject. The subject is framed in a particular question that all writers hear over and over again. And I've steered clear of it every time because it's such a difficult subject to address. And it is this, where do you get your ideas? Because really, we could write books about this, but wait a minute, I think I did. And it's the kind of thing that you can go on on and on and on about, and nobody cares except for the things that apply directly to them. So whatever I'm going to say to you today, you're free to use if you're a writer, you're free to riff on if you're not. Uh, Maybe some of it will be helpful to you. Maybe it won't. We'll wish for the best. But at least you'll get to hear how one writer approaches the subject of putting ideas together. Let me start with this. I'm I'm going to give you three obvious examples of uh, areas that I had to consider early on and have had to consider ever since on a regular basis in order to make my storylines work. Um, And for each one, there's a number of things to consider. The first one is something I call shuck your baggage. Uh, When I'm saying shuck your baggage, I'm saying to you, cut loose all the stuff that doesn't apply to what you're doing in your life that's important. So what does that mean? Well, in my case, it meant that at one point in my life I was writing and I was discovering I was not doing well at anything else. So I quit writing and I, then I still wasn't doing very well at anything else. And what I really discovered was, is that if you're going to be successful in this business, you have to find a way to balance the way that these, all the, all the things that are in your life work. Um, and part of that has to do with the fact that Everything you know now, or everything I knew then, which has been you know more than 60 years ago, is going to change. It's not going to stay the same. It's like you aging. Everything you do when you're 20 is different by the time you're, oh, let's say 60 or 70. The reason it changes is because, number one, you change. Number two, the world changes. Think about this. When I started out, computers weren't there as personal computers. We used handheld, hand hand operated, not even electric typewriters to do our work or pens and pencils. And that's how writers grew up working in that fashion. I started fairly early uh, professionally in my 30s with a an old uh, Apple computer, an Apple II or something like that. And that's how I learned to be a writer is with that computer. How much has that changed? Well, you know, we could go on a long way about how the mechanics and the operations of computers have changed to the extent that now it's much easier and smoother to work. Something that my old editor, Lester Del Rey, once told me, this has ruined writers forever because now it's so easy to put something down. They think everything they put down is wonderful. And there is a temptation to believe that when it becomes so easy to do so. 
But I think, uh, you know, video games, social media, uh, television, all of those things are extraneous to the work that you're doing. If you're a writer, you should be reading books and you should be reading books all the time. You know, you should make that a major part of the work that you do because you're working in that field. But I'll talk about that a little more until uh, a little more later. Um, so in any case, uh, I believe that the first thing you should do when you start to put a book together is to work it out in your head. Put it in your head. Uh, go over it as many times as you need to. Work it out step by step, scene by scene, story by story, sub story by story, all the way through. And evolve it as you go. Rework it as you go, rethink it as you go, but don't write it down. Put it in your head. Because if you can't remember it, it's probably not that good anyway, and you weren't meant to remember it. Keep it in your head for a while. When you get to the point where you absolutely can't help yourself any longer and you do feel you need to write it down, then by all means, go ahead and do it. But the point is you want to stretch it out as long as you can in a place where you can call upon it. And if your memory works the way that most people's memories do, stories tend to stay there quite a bit longer than otherwise. After you've got enough of your story down to a point where you think you've got the sense of the world, you've got a sense of where things should be, what you want to do, what your big idea is, that sort of thing, then you have to talk about characters. And that's when you have to have a casting call. And what do you do at a casting call? Well, it's just like it is in the movies or in plays or in any form of entertainment. You decide who the characters ought to be. And how do you do that? Well, you always have characters floating around in your head if you're anything like me. You're always thinking about how somebody was or how they should be or what it'd be interesting to be if they were there. So you pull them out and you put them on stage and you look for a part for them in the story. It's pretty easy, really. You always have an antagonist. You have a protagonist. You have the companions of each. You might have some kind of a strange creature. You might have all kinds of things, a love interest. It doesn't matter. All of these things have to be there or many of them have to be there to make your story come together. So you start trying them out in different formats and you can do this in any way you want to. But the point is you have to see if you can find something that seems to you to fit. If you do that, you have character one or two or whatever. If they don't work back to central casting, they can come out later in another story or they won't. And we'll have to see what's the most important thing about the characters that you put in a story. I bet you don't know. They have to serve purpose in advancing the plot. That is the most important thing. The plot is at the service of the characters. The characters are at the service of the writer. You have to create characters that do something to advance the story and don't just hang around looking as if they were trying to find something to do. This is not easy, but it's doable and you can do it because I bet you you've done any writing at all. You've probably done it. The third thing I want to talk to you about that I think is really important has to do with the fact that you have to be consistent and you have to be creative, but you also have to be dogmatic in your approach. When it comes to putting together, this is your format. You write, then you rewrite, and then you write some more, and then you rewrite some more, and then you do it again any number of times. Everybody works in a different way. Everybody finds a more comfortable way to advance a story. But the thing is, you have to find a format that works for you, something that you're comfortable with, but also achieves what you're trying to get done. If you find yourself being blocked off or you're unable to advance often enough, then you're probably not doing something in the right way. And you need to think about how to do it. And for everyone in this business, everyone, the one thing I know for sure is that nobody works in the same way. Everybody works in a different way. Everybody thinks about approaching a story and puts together a story and creates that story with all kinds of different things that happen. You have to find the way that works for you. Uh, one of my favorite writers, as a matter of fact, told me that the way she does it is she writes plot first, then she goes back and she does it rough form, just rough form and writes the plot. Then she goes in and she adds the characters. And then after she's done with that, she goes back and works out the time and the place and the you know, how to show and so forth and all of that and so on and so forth. She has like, I don't know, eight or 10 steps that she takes in putting this together. That would drive me crazy. I could not possibly do that. My approach, for example, is to go through and write the story piecemeal as I go concentrically in order, 
And then at the end of every stopping point, which is usually a chapter, go back and rewrite it. Do it again until you get it to point where you like it. This won't be the end of it, but it's a place where you can move forward. I can move forward to where I think I've got something to work from in building the next chapter. So there's a cohesion to everything as I go. But this is, these are just, you know, this is one way to do it. And the trick is to find the way that works for you and to find a way that feels, you know, a part and parcel of who you are so that it works the right way. Okay. A couple other things I want to talk about before my time is up. I mentioned earlier about the importance of engaging yourself in the area in which you're working. So if I were, you know, if I were making movies or I was on theater, that's what I would probably be most involved in. But I'm not, I'm writing books. So how do I feel about an approach to writing books? Well, the first thing is, is that it means you have to read a lot. And the way you learn about the craft because it's changing all the time. You know, I used to think that the approach of young adult uh, fiction was something to be avoided at all costs. Now, young adult fiction is one of the big monsters that moves the whole industry. And the way that it's developed, it has been astonishing. And we have some terrific, terrific writers working in that field that don't get nearly the kind of notes they ought to have. But the point is, is that if you don't read in the field, you don't know about this. Also, whatever you're reading, if it's only in the field that you're working in, change it right now. Don't do that. Read outside your field. Why should you do that? Well, because if you're only reading science fiction or you're reading fantasy or reading horror, that's mostly what you're going to learn. And you're going to learn it from other writers. But the point is, is that sometimes you'll discover in reading something in, say, literary fiction that appeals to you, or historical fiction, or even nonfiction, you're going to find ideas come to you about things to do that you wouldn't have seen otherwise. Because I write in worlds where we're not involved directly, it's always what I know about this world transposed into a world that I've created from whatever. If I have my world to work from, I kind of know what it is I want to say that I want to get across it. i just have to put it in a different format. And I think that's a much more successful way for me to work than to try to just create something from nothing and not pay attention to what's going on in the larger world. And I've said this many times, you know, I wrote a whole series of four books in the Shannara series, all about the, econ the ecology, uh, about the way ecology is being destroyed, about the way the world is being wasteful, so on and so forth. I wrote, any number of books that had to do with how do you redeem yourself when you have created the mortal sin or any series of mortal sins? Is there a point where you can't come back or can you always come back? And if you can, how do you do it? To me, these are questions that are, uh, that, that are applicable to all of our lives and that impact all of our lives as well because of the way the world around us works. These are the kind of things that engage us immediately because we have an immediate identification with it. And I think that's something that you would lose if you don't read outside your field, if you don't read contemporary fiction, if you don't look at areas that you don't normally engage in. So that's the kind of things I think you should, you should consider doing. And I think you have to be experimental at what you're doing too. You have to experiment with where you're going with the kinds of stories you're writing, because again, we're back to that whole thing about everything in your life is going to change. And what interested me, you know, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, I'm not so interested in that anymore. I'm interested in other things. And I want to write stories that speak to what interests me at the time. I want to write about issues that are generic to my life but are impactful at the time that I'm addressing them. Um, and I believe that particularly with something like fantasy and science fiction and generic fiction, that you're always looking for ways to extrapolate from the real and put it into the creative and seeing what you can make of it and how you can make it come alive the way you would like it to. Final thing that I'll throw out before I say that's enough of that. Um, I started out as a pretty shy little kid. Um, I'm the kid that got beat up all the time on the way to school. And uh, 
in the days we walked to school. I don't know if that happens anymore, but I did. I had to walk a mile to school every day. So uh, there were lots of chances for someone to beat me up. And I was about, you know, four foot high. So it was pretty easy business for most people. Um, and I discovered uh, that uh, part of what you need to do with your life is to envision yourself as something better than what you are and then try to make something come of that. And there's all kinds of ways to do that. I'm not going to get into that because that'll just take us forever. But I am going to tell you that uh, you need to... Uh, develop your ability to communicate with other people. Um, you need to be able to address issues and problems that you're going to encounter. And this is not only true of just your general life, but it's very much true of your life as a writer. When I started out, uh, the theory in the field was that writers should stay home. My editor told me this uh, flat out. He says, you're not going on tour. You won't, you don't need to do that. You're not, you're not anybody particular at this point. And I said, well, I just sold Sword of Shannara. What do you want? And he said, I want four more books and then we'll talk. And he wasn't kidding. He said, you will stay home. You will stay at the desk. You will do your writing. And after you've gotten to that point, then we can talk about you going on the road. You know, he would roll over in his grave now since, you know, we've gotten into a, an area where writers tour all the time. But the point was, is he felt that you had to learn to express yourself before an audience he felt that you needed to learn who you were and what you were as a writer and have something to talk about besides, you know, the wonderfulness of yourself or of your work or something like that. You needed to be able to address the situation, whatever it was, and you needed to be able to do, to, to do this in a spontaneous way. I got a break because I was a lawyer for a long time, and that makes you prepared for just about anything in this world. Um, I can't say that uh, it prepared me for being a successful writer uh, because writing legal briefs has nothing to do with writing fantasy, even though in my world, it's a short putt. Thank you very much. Nice to see you all. New York Times, USA Today, and Globe and Mail best-selling author Susanna Kearsley is a former museum curator who loves restoring the lost voices of real people to the page, writing twin-stranded stories that typically interweave modern adventure with romance, historical intrigue, and sometimes an edge of the unexplained. First published in 1994, she's been a full-time writer since 1996 and is currently at work on her 15th novel. Her books, which have sold over a million copies in North America alone, are available in translation in more than 25 countries, have won the Catherine Cookson Fiction Prize, RT Reviewer's Choice Awards, and National Reader's Choice Awards, and been finalists for the UK's Romantic Novel of the Year and the Crime Writers of Canada's Arthur Ellis Award for Best Novel. A settler on Anishinaabe land near Toronto, she has also lived in Texas, South Korea, and, all too briefly, in Wales. And thank you for making me go after Terry Brooks. That's really not nice. Terry, that was wonderful. That was wonderful. I love the short putt line. As Mark said, um, I am a settler on Anishinaabe lands uh, here in Ontario. I'd like to start by extending my, my respect to their elders past and present and that same respect to anybody who might be joining us who is Indigenous and uh, encouraging everybody to learn what treaty binds them to the, the land and the peoples that, uh, that they are living on and, and, and to honour that treaty, please. Okay, so it was difficult for me to try to figure out what to do my my um, keynote on. I'm not great with keynotes, but I really wanted to do a good one for you, so I did my best. I went looking for a, a quote that would sort of embody what I was trying to to talk about. So I think I found one. We're often told that that writing is a lonely life, and I was looking for a, a quote that would sort of talk about that. And I found one by the American author Jessamine West, who said, writing is a solitary occupation. Family, friends, and society are the natural enemies of the writer. He must be alone, I guess he or she, must be alone, uninterrupted, and slightly savage if he is to sustain and complete an undertaking. As with many maxims, it does hold a core of truth. When we put pen to paper or fingers to keyboard, we are on our own. 
And I've often said it's not unlike the miller's daughter in the Rumpelstiltskin fairy tale who's left alone with bales of straw and asked to spin them into gold, except we are left alone with reams of paper that we're being asked to turn into a finished novel or a finished story. So yes, that part, getting the words down on paper, getting the story down, only we can do that. And to do that, most of us will have to make some hard choices. We have to turn down some invitations. We have to shut ourselves away a little. That's kind of a feature of our lives. But solitary? No. I'm, what I do, I never truly do alone. Far from being my natural enemies, family and friends and societies are the things helping me to write. Take my family, for starters. Early in my writing career, I was fortunate to have my sister who bought me how to write books and wrote in the flyleaf, because I'll always believe in you, who pestered and dared me to finish my first book and cheered me along at every step. I had my parents who let me move home with them as an adult and gave me a room in their house, that Virginia Woolf room of one's own that is so essential for anyone trying to write. When I married and had my own children, my own little family, they helped me too, both with their hugs on the bad days, the days when a publisher dropped me, and there were quite a few of those, or when the words weren't coming well, but also with their purposeful absence by giving me privacy, giving me space, taking over the housework to give me the time that I needed to write. Any child or spouse of a writer deserves an award. They deserve a medal. It's not easy. We sometimes forget them. We don't always feed them. We wander around half in this world and half in the world of our characters. But I could never do what I do without my family. My friends too are always essential. My writer friends help reassure me it's okay to hear voices in my head. It's perfectly natural and everybody does it. It's perfectly natural. When I'm not sure what to do with a story, my writer friends are always there with advice. They're my sounding board. They're sometimes the first people who hear my stories. And in the middle of each work in progress that I start, when I'm sure that I've lost all my talent, when I'm sure that the publishers are gonna make me return my advance, when I'm sure that I can no longer write and the readers are gonna hate this book and I'm sure I should just throw this new book in the garbage can every single time I start a book. They convince me it's okay that I do this every time. They remind me that I do this every time. It's okay. I will get through it, they say. And maybe they tell me, maybe it's time for my non-writer friends to just come grab me and drag me out of my writing room just for a little while to remind me that there's a whole world out there beyond the page. It's that world, that society, that we writers need if we're going to have anything to write about. And it's that society that also supports us. I'll give you a little example. Years ago, when I landed in Scotland, I was doing the research for my book, The Shadowy Horses. I landed in Scotland on a bank holiday weekend with no place to stay because that was how much forethought I gave to it. Um, a bed and breakfast owner named Margaret McGovern took me in at the last minute. And as I was coming in the front door of her bed and breakfast with my suitcase, she was going out on her way to teach her country dancing class. And she asked me why I was in Eyemouth, Scotland of all places. It's a very small town on the coast just over the border and really not a place that a lot of people would be coming to on a bank holiday weekend. It's just a little fishing town was a little fishing town in those days. And I was just sort of getting to the point in my career, this was 1994. Um, I had won the Catherine Cookson Prize. My book was about to be published for the first time. Um, I was just getting to the point where I felt comfortable telling people I was a writer. I felt kind of like a writer. So I told her, I'm a writer. I'm here researching a novel. And that felt kind of you know, grand. And she said, oh, I, in that sort of, you know, Scottish way that, that they have that where it's just kind of, yeah, yeah. And out she went to teach her country dancing class. She came back two hours later with a list. This 
long, very, very long, of all the people that I was meant to meet over the next week and a half who were going to help me with my novel. One of the first people on the list was the local minister. I had to meet him twice. I had to go first to the early service to meet him and make myself known to him. And then I had to go meet him. But the second service, he was going to take me out to a ruined priory that they decided needed to be in my book. So I better go out there with him. They found a house that I needed to use for my book. They had all decided, everybody at the class decided that I needed to use this house in my book because a murder had happened there once in the 1700s, which would make it the perfect, perfect setting for my novel. Um, turned out it actually was the perfect setting for my novel and I did use it, but at the time I didn't know this. The, the only problem was the woman who owned the house was a very reclusive uh, woman, a little shy. She had just been burgled a couple of weeks before. And now here was this young Canadian, I was only in my 20s, woman being sort of thrust upon her to, to go and see this house. So I thought, well, what if I go to the police station first and I'll show them my passport? And then this woman will know that I'm not a complete crackpot and, and I'm a legitimate person. So I went to the police station and the police officer, a young police officer behind the, the, the desk in this two person police station said, oh, you're the writer. He said, are there any murders in your book? And I said, well, not yet. And he said, well, if there are any murders, be sure you give us a phone call. Here's my card. There's always one of us in here. Then he brought the other person out, showed me. So everywhere I went in the town, this is what happened. Everybody came out of doors to help me. Every single person. If I went around the harbor, people came off their fishing boats, invited me onto their fishing boats, almost took me out you know, to sea in their fishing boats. It was just the entire community came out and helped me. That woman, Margaret McGovern, who was my my bed and breakfast owner is still a dear friend of mine 30 years on, nearly 30 years on. Society, you know, helped me write that book. I would not have been able to write that book if that town had not taken me under its wing. And that has happened more times than I can count in the writing of my books, more times than I can count. Society is not my enemy. Madeline Lengel wrote, the writing of a book may be a solitary business. It is done alone. The writer sits down with paper and pen or typewriter and withdrawn from the world tries to set down the story that is crying to be written. We write alone, but we do not write in isolation. No matter how fantastic a storyline may be, it still comes out of our response to what is happening to us and to the world in which we live. I totally agree. Friends, family, and society will never be our enemies. They're what makes our writing possible. They hold us up and carry us and keep us sane. We may sit alone with our pen, our paper, our typewriter, our computer, but we are never, ever on our own. And I hope you remember that as you go through your writing career. Thanks very much. And those are the first two keynotes from When Words Collide from Terry Brooks and Susanna Kearsley. And I just wanted to briefly reflect on uh, a few things. Now, if, if you want to hear the discussion that we all had afterwards, I will have a link to the full video in the show notes at starkreflections.ca. But I wanted to reflect on a, on a couple of things. And, and they, they, they kind of are, are linked. And, and I, did, I did mention this in the discussion. And it's really fascinating to hear Terry and Susanna and, and the other guests who you're going to hear from in, in the next episode uh, talk about this. But the have to read a lot from Terry Brooks, which I thought was really, really important. And reading outside your field and your genre, and it's just the, the way that this helps you grow as a writer. I mean, not just reading and understanding the genres you're writing in and the styles you're writing in, but just expanding and, and increasing your ability to appreciate story and what's going on in a good story or a bad story, or whatever it is, because all of those things can help you learn. And I think that's so, so critical. First, you have to read a lot to be a writer, to be a good writer. You have to read a lot. You have to understand things. And reading outside your your um, your field is really, really critical. So so think about that when in the way that Terry expressed that as a very, very important aspect. But it kind of it kind of ties into 
you know, Susanna talking about that, you know, that the solitary life of a writer isn't so solitary. Uh, and, you know, in the, in the quote she shared at, at the end, in the closing of her keynote, was we write alone, but we do not write in isolation. And, and, and that kind of ties back to what Terry was talking about, because, you know, we don't just read in our genres, we, we, we read in, in an expanded universe, but that ties back into, I'd mentioned earlier, the, the community and all of the support, like Susanna outlined so many of the different people who helped her on her writing journey along the way. And even the anecdote about being in the village and traveling and all of the people who came to be part of that for her, they helped build this thing for her. So it was kind of like, uh, you know, as writers, we stand on the shoulders of those who came before us. We stand on those books we've read. We stand on the communities and the people who support us, who have our backs, whether they're beloved family members or uh, spouses or partners, friends, or even strangers that we encounter along the way. So critical when you think about that overall community, and that's what this is a part of, right? And it goes back to, you know, I mentioned in the comments section earlier in this episode, it's about that community. It's about how we can all prop each other up, how we can all be part of something bigger and grander when we do it together. Yeah, button chair, fingers on keyboard, that work has to happen. You know, wherever our ideas come from, and I love that Terry addressed that, wherever they come from, we do the work usually in solitude, even when working with an editor or a co-author, because that moment is, is, is between us and the, and the blank page. But so much of our heart and spirit and essence that comes from writing comes from those connections that we have. We are writing these texts within the context of the society, within our friendships, within the relationships that we have. So thinking about the wonderful nuance of that isolation and community and, and how the more we expand our reading, the more we expand our community, the better off we are as writers and, and of course, as people. Well, that's it for this episode. That's it for the reflections. I hope you enjoyed these awesome keynotes from Terry and Susanna. I'm going to be reaching out to them, of course, to see if they would be willing to come on and I can do a one-on-one -on -one conversation or interview with them, which I think would be just absolutely fascinating. They're awesome folks. Um, and as well, you're going to hear from Hank, Philippi, Ryan, and Edward Willett in an episode that's coming out not too far after this. It's going to come out sometime between, obviously, this episode and next Friday's episode. But thank you, dear listeners, so much for listening to this Dark Reflections podcast. If you want to support the podcast, of course, we talked about the Patreon earlier on, but you don't have to do that. I would love it if you could leave a review on whatever place you listen to podcasts on, or better yet, share this podcast with someone that you think would find value in it. And so, this is the end of episode 263. Until next episode, this is Mark Leslie LeFave wishing you great writing and good Stark Reflections. Thank you for listening to the Stark Reflections podcast. You can find show notes for each episode at starkreflections.ca. The music for this podcast, Laser Groove, was composed and produced by Kevin McLeod. Check out more of Kevin's great music at incomptech.com.